Hi guys and welcome to HTP Storytime. Today we are going to be investigating Bigfoot in South Africa. There are many stories from around the world about people encountering humanoid apes, creatures that are unknown to science. We have Bigfoot sightings in America, we've got the Yeti in Asia, we've got the Almas in Mongolia, there's the Hibagong in Japan, and of course everyone's favorite, the Yowie from Australia, ladies and gentlemen. But the one continent that appears to be devoid of these sightings is Africa. Now Africa does have its fair share of mysterious and mythical creatures, but nothing that quite matches the description of a Sasquatch. If you take into account that the southern tip of the continent has been referred to as the cradle of humanity, it would make sense that some ancient ape-like species must have lived in the region of South Africa at some point in the distant past. Now there are some mythical creatures like the Aiga Muchab, there's the Grootslang and the Das Adder, but these are all creatures I've only heard from on the internet. I've never encountered any references to the, these creatures in my own personal life. I am however familiar with more tangible mysteries like uh, the Goliath's footprint in Mpumalanga. But apparently there are no stories of Bigfoot or Sasquatch reported in South Africa or Africa in general. Why is that? Paula Kahumbu, the executive director of Wildlife Direct, says about the fauna of Africa. Africa is the only continent remaining on Earth where most megafauna survive, including elephants, rhino, antelopes, great apes, and big cats. And this leads one to assume that even if there was a Bigfoot roaming South Africa, it would be one of the less impressive creatures, right? Especially since it would have to compete with at least the silverback gorilla, which in itself is a really, really impressive animal. But that being said, a creature as singular as Bigfoot surely would make an impression on people, even if there's a lot of competition for it. I don't think based on the eyewitness accounts we are aware of of Bigfoot that anybody would mistake Bigfoot for something else, right? I think the one commonality between all Bigfoot sightings is that the creature is always described as ape-like, but not 100% animal. There's always something human about it. So it's safe to say that if you saw a Bigfoot, you'd know it, right? And now this leads us back to the original question. Why are there no Bigfoot sightings in South Africa? But here's the thing. Maybe there are. Africa, just like many countries on Earth, is a country with a strong oral tradition amongst people. Right? So not everything is going to be found online or in a textbook. So let's delve a bit deeper into South African oral traditions and see what is the case for Bigfoot in South Africa. Let's go. South Africa, located as the name subtly implies at the tip of the African continent. The seed of what was to become the South African Republic was planted when the Dutch trading company, the Verenigde Oos Indische Compagnie, or VOC, created a trading post here in 1652, in what would eventually become Cape Town. Over the next few decades, it would grow into a unique diverse and somewhat integrated community consisting of both indigenous groups and European settlers. For almost 200 years, the Dutch colony would continue to grow and develop until France decided to attack the group of provinces 
that made up the Dutch Republic. France, now in control of their land, by extension now also controlled the Verenigde Oost Indische Compagnie, and by further extension, France was now in control of the Dutch colony. Seeing this, the British Empire, who were at war with France, decided that the burgeoning Dutch colony would be much better off integrated into their global trading network. They immediately decided to liberate the Dutch colony from their smelly French overlords and to make themselves the new overlords. Now, not many people were happy with their new British rulers, but there was one group who really weren't happy, the Boers. The Boers were a culturally unique offshoot of the European settlers. They soon found themselves in various different conflicts with their new British rulers, and they decided that enough was enough. They were going to be picking up their ball, going home, packing up that home, and moving a million, million miles away from their smelly British overlords. They packed everything they owned into their oxen wagons and decided to move away and find a place where they can be free and left alone. This was to become the Groot Trek, or the Great Trek. And so thousands upon thousands of farmers packed up their stuff and moved into the unknown interior of South Africa. There were no roads, no maps, and they were moving through rough mountainous terrain. It was an unbelievable undertaking with near insurmountable odds pitted against them. But hey, when you hate the British, you really hate the British. Only the most determined families made their way inland as far as the Waterberg in North Transvaal. And this is where one resilient family, the Fenters, found themselves. They thought they had finally found the peaceful life that they were looking for. But an event occurred that would leave their minds in a state of unease for the rest of their lives. By 1860, the Fenters had settled down, they'd managed to set up a sustainable farm, and their Groot Trek had come to an end. Against all odds, they survived the harrowing journey from Cape Town to the Denokana region in northern Transvaal. But their peaceful existence was not meant to last. One night, one of the farmhands frantically woke them up and said that an ape-like bipedal creature with thickish brown hair was stealing their cattle. When the Fenter family came outside, one of the sheep was indeed missing. The farmhand explained that the creature had simply hopped the fence of the cattle enclosure, snatched the sheep under its arm and walked off with it. Now, cattle theft was pretty common at the time. All the farmers had to deal with it. And we don't have a record of what Father Fenter was thinking at the time, hearing this story, but we can assume he, he took it with a grain of salt. Whether he believed the farmhand or not, it doesn't really matter because the sheep was gone and there was nothing they could do about it. So life went on as usual, minus one sheep for the Fenter family. But as the story started to spread, as word got round, Father Fenter heard more and more of the exact same stories told by different farmers, that some ape-like bipedal creature with thick brown hair would be hopping cattle enclosures and stealing livestock. Now this couldn't really be ignored by the Fenters, so this led them to organizing search parties with other local farmers to try and ascertain what is happening with their livestock. These search parties were going to either find the missing livestock or gain some kind of closure as to who or what was stealing the cattle. But instead of uncovering some kind of organized crime ring, all the search parties could find was the mutilated half-eaten corpses of their missing livestock. Now the farmers in the area were well familiar with all the carnivorous animals in the in their immediate vicinity, but none of the wounds and markings on the livestock they found matched any of the creatures they were familiar with. Everyone agreed that the wounds were inflicted by something very powerful. What eyewitnesses had seen 
and what the farmers themselves could see on the mutilated corpses of their cattle did not line up with traditional cattle feeds. All eyewitnesses described something with ape-like features, thick brown hair, and something that was powerfully built and bipedal. Now, the farmers might not have been familiar with every single animal on the African continent, but what else could they be describing? As we said at the start of this episode, when you see a Bigfoot, you would know what you see. You know, you're not necessarily going to be confusing it with any other type of great ape. Now, you might say, Harold, this is all just speculation. But the kicker comes when the Fenters speak to the local Twana tribespeople. When the Fenters spoke to the local Twana tribespeople and told them about the stock disappearances and described what they saw, the Twana people weren't surprised at all. They were well familiar with the creature. Not only that, but they believed that the creature lived in a cave near water. And if the creature was ever killed, it would mean long periods of drought for the region. The fact that these tribespeople were familiar with the creature being described implies that there was already an existing oral tradition within the tribe describing sightings of this creature. I mean, even if the tribespeople spoken to hadn't seen the creature themselves, there clearly was already some story told from tribe to tribe, generation to generation, describing this creature, sightings of this creature, documenting this creature. Someone in the tribe at some point had either seen the creature themselves or heard the same stories told about this creature. As with many indigenous cultures that underwent a period of colonization, a lot of these oral traditions have been lost to time. But we do have some more tangible evidence of indigenous people witnessing this ape-like creature. The Tswana people were not the only tribe to be entangled with a Bigfoot-type creature. The Khoi and the San peoples are one of the oldest people groups on Earth and indigenous to South Africa. The South African landscape is dotted with sites of their rock art. This incredible people's culture has been almost lost except for a few words still used in the local Afrikaans language and a handful of traditional stories kept alive by a handful of traditional tribes. We do, however, have their amazing rock art to tell some of their lost stories. We can see them collecting the kill from their hunts. We can see the variety of animals important to them and we can see scenes of mass feasts and gatherings. And it is here in the Khoi San rock art, in goed gegeven farm in Warden, that we find one of the most compelling pieces of evidence of Bigfoot in South Africa. It's literally the 2000 year old version of the Patterson Gimlin film that first captured Bigfoot on film in the 70s. Could this scene be referring to the same creature responsible for the cattle thefts experienced by the fenters and the farmers in their community? We can see the Bushmen tribes on the right hand side fighting off these hunched hairy beings on the left, clearly in some kind of conflict with each other. Is this rock painting evidence for a long history of Bigfoot in South Africa that has now been lost to time and only kept alive by the oral traditions between tribes. But this is not where the stories end. The next cultural reference point for Bigfoot in South Africa came from the 1941 poem Raka by N. P. van Weyck Lowe. It's an epic poem in the Afrikaans language about a hairy, ape-like creature called Raka. Primitive yet sly, this creature ingratiates itself with a local tribe, causing dissension amongst the people. As a poem, some people may argue that the story is purely allegorical, but my question is what was the seed of inspiration for this story? Did N.P. van Weyck see Bigfoot in the 30s and think, 
you know what, I'm going to write a story about this, but the creature is going to be smaller and metaphorical. Or maybe, from what we have heard so far, this story is part of a long-running indigenous narrative that has been told for generations. It starts, Die vrouwe het om eerste gewaar in die loom na middag, to die arbeid klaar was. Oor kan die water het hy uitgestap uit die gebreekte riete, wit gegrijns en neergehurk, gewag. It says the woman saw him first, in the afternoon after their work was done. They saw him from across the river, coming out from behind the broken reeds. He saw them, gave them a toothy smile, hunkered down and waited. And it goes on. Te midde van hulle vrees het hy hulle behaag met sy mal spronge. It says the people were a bit apprehensive at first when they saw him, but as soon as he started leaping and splashing in the water like a dog, their fears were alleviated. The people trusted him, so much so that eventually Raka started following them back home to their village. At night, when the people sat around their fires, he would keep their distance, but creep ever, ever closer. And once the fires had died down and were just burning coals, light sleepers could hear him sniffing around the edges of the village, all along the fencing. The prince of the tribe, Corky, did not trust this creature and he warned the people. Ken Raka, hy die sterk dier, ons fijn fijn net van die woord, waarmee ons blink en vet visse uit baie waters haal. Ken hy die vuur geheim? Het hy die faaldrade van die katoen leer spin en weef en in die kleurpot week? Het hy leer leef onder die wette wat ons oudstes sing? He says the creature knows no language, it knows no culture, it's purely operating on instinct. He says it has no laws, it has no rules, and it has no morals. He goes on to say to the villagers, Die snel dier moet dood, of hy sal heers oor ons en groot en lang pijn bring. Meaning, we have to kill this creature, or it will bring years and years of suffering and pain. It's interesting to see that in both the story of Raka and the story that the local Tswana tribes people were telling, this creature lives close to water, and they both felt that this creature's life was tied to serious consequences for the land. The poem ends with the line, Die jachters wis wat krag was, en hulle het gefrees. That means, the hunters knew what power was, and they were scared. Now it wasn't until 20 years after this poem was written that another sighting comes into the mass consciousness. It's simply two young boys walking on the farm Leeuwensfontein in Koster who have a sighting of an ape-like creature walking amongst the hills. It was reported in the magazine Die Vaderland in 1965. This was two years before the famous Patterson-Gimlin film, which was the first time Bigfoot was caught on film. Now again, if these kids were lying, where did the story come from? Surely they hadn't seen or heard of the Patterson-Gimlin film two years before it was released. Did they just out of nowhere decide to make up a story of an ape-like creature walking amongst the hills? Or is this yet again more evidence for a long-running indigenous narrative of this ape-like creature roaming the land, stories that have been told from generation to generation and confirmed by eyewitness sightings. Which brings us to the modern day and the town of Nizna in the Western Cape. This is a heavily forested area that was once home to a creature that both the Afrikaans and the Otaniqua people called Bigfoot or Oldfoot, the Nizna elephant, ladies and gentlemen. At some point in the last 1000 years, a herd of elephants made their way down the South African continent to Nizna. They settled here and called the Nizna forest their home for who knows how long. This was until the government ordered their eradication in 1919 
due to complaints from local farmers. By 1920, only 16 individuals were left alive after the massacre, and today it's believed that only one is left alive. Enter researcher Gareth Patterson, who thought otherwise and set out to prove it. In March of 2020, he set out into the dense forests in the region to find some trace of elephants still left alive. He clung to the hope that these ancient travelers did not make their way all the way down to the tip of the continent just to have their lineage die forever. He said that during the course of his research, he found evidence for at least three more individuals left alive, but he also uncovered something else entirely. Patterson was staying at a local hotel while doing his research. On the second day, he asked the owner of the hotel for some directions to the Deep Valle Forest Station as he wanted to start his research there. After giving him directions, the owner starts telling him a strange story about an experience he had a few days prior. He said that a group of German tourists asked him for directions to the Deep Valle Forest Station, just as Gareth was doing now. And a few hours later, he finds them in the bar in a shocked state. The hotel owner walks up to them and asks them, Hey, how did your trip go? You guys look a bit worse for wear. They said they were driving down the road and wanted to pull over to double check the directions he had given them. As they start slowing down, they see a group of figures standing by the side of the road. As they pull over to the curb to stop, these creatures spot them and run across the road and disappear into the dense Nisna forest. They describe the creatures they saw as humanoid apes. Now naturally the owner suggests to them that what they saw was a troop of baboons, an animal very common in the Nisna forests, and they're known for harassing and even robbing tourists. They often, after snatching food from people, run off on their hind legs. Now at the suggestion of this, the German tourists become irate. They immediately say that they're well-traveled, they've seen loads of different animals, and what they saw were not baboons. Now at the start of this video, we said that if you see Bigfoot, you know you saw Bigfoot. The traits and characteristics of the animal is not something that you're going to be confusing with a gorilla or a chimp or in this case, a baboon. To quote Patterson here, you know, when you do see these beings, it leaves you in a terrible, terrible shocked state because you've seen something that according to science doesn't exist. It's like post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, Gareth made no more of this story at the time after hearing it. He just thought it was an interesting anecdote that he can tell his friends later after his research on the elephants were done but the idea kept rattling around in his head for some reason. He went about completing his research on the elephants, and as he did so, he started chatting with a few locals. And to his surprise, more and more stories came forward about these creatures that the locals had a name for. They called them the Otang. He soon realized that this experience of the German tourists was not a one-off event in the area. This was such an amazing find for Gareth that he even included the book he published of his research on the elephants, a book called The Secret Elephant. At the book launch, four more locals came forward from the audience with the same stories of seeing the Otang, an ape-like bipedal creature that can be seen walking in the forests of Neisner. Now that is unfortunately where the story ends for now. South Africa might not have the history of documented cases that you'd find in other places across the world, but clearly there is still a narrative for Bigfoot in South Africa. There's eyewitness sightings, there's clearly oral traditions amongst local indigenous tribes. So what does this mean? Have we proved that Bigfoot is alive and well in South Africa? Maybe not. But we can clearly see there is a strong case for Bigfoot in South Africa. That's about it, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like and subscribe for more. I hope I've managed to expand your mind and perhaps give you a further appreciation for what unknown mysteries still lie in the continent. Thanks for watching, guys. Mm -hmm.